In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ, in this Lenten season, on this fifth day in the month of March. In the year of our Lord, 2022, let us begin with a prayer to our Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our last segment, we spoke of light, and we're still covering the theology of light in this broadcast on learning to live in God's divine will, referring to sacred scripture, the magisterial teachings of the Church, and the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, several of which enjoy the Church's present-day official seals of approval. Now, we are living in days of darkness and confusion, as has been prophesied not only in sacred scripture, but also in recent approved Marian apparitions. Our Lady has forewarned us that these days would come. And therefore, beginning, I suppose, with the Lord, and continuing from Fatima through the apparitions of um, Karabandal, and Co-op in Nicaragua, Akita, Japan, Naju, Korea, and so forth. Our Lady has been preparing us for these times. Now, of all these apparitions I've mentioned to you, which are just few of approved, well, Marian apparitions, the one that's not approved officially by the Church is the Garabandal message, but depending upon the local ordinary, people can go there and openly pray, even in the church there, in Santander, honoring Our Lady of Carabandal. And what I wish to emphasize is that when you come across an alleged apparition that's not yet formally approved by the church, like that of Carabandal, and you don't know whether or not it's true, how do you proceed? Well, before talking of the theology of light and the writings of Louisa, let me address this very briefly. Remember the shepherd, the shepherds who saw the angels crying out in preparation of the birth of Christ, leading the shepherds to the crib. Peace on earth to men of good will. If the shepherds waited for the Sanhedrin to give approval to this apparition, they would have missed the boat, so to speak. The church does not require, my first point, there are three points I wish to emphasize here. My first point is the church does not require that before it gives official approval, you do not believe in that apparition. It does not require that the church. You may you are free to believe in an apparition even before the church gives its approval. Point number two, no less important and perhaps more important than point number one. There are many false prophets out there today. You see, God chooses few souls with whom he endows extraordinary charisms. That means that the vast majority do not receive these charisms. That's why they're called extraordinary. If the vast majority receive these charisms, they would be called ordinary, but they're not. Unfortunately, many people out there are claiming to receive these, these um, those messages from Mary and Jesus, and the vast majority, sad to say, are not directly from God, but are produced by personal meditation, their own thought patterns, and sometimes 
the agency of the devil. Now, there are criteria the church puts forth for you so as to avoid being deceived by false messages, false locutions, false websites posting the latest seer. Avoid these, please. They distract you from penetrating the one solid, unchanging message of Christ reiterated by the church and prophesied by Mary in her approved prophetic revelations. Of these many criteria, one is sound doctrine. Now, most people do not know well 2,000 years of church theology, which is sound doctrine. And you have to have that as a backdrop against which to review these alleged unapproved revelations or locutions. Now, why is it bad to run after the latest alleged locution unapproved by the church? Because it distracts you from the solid message of Christ, which never changes. People that run after these latest messages waste their time. They're like bees fluttering from one flower to the next without ever settling on one. And just as they find out about one, they stop it and go to the next. And just as they find out about the next, they stop it and go to the next. This saps you of quality in spiritual growth. Trust me, I, I, I know scores of individuals and alleged seers from different countries where I've traveled. And I speak from experience, not just from my gut, as some people you know, reference as the sole source of their criteria determinations. Now, the second criterion, in addition to sound doctrine, to refer to and to use as a backdrop when assessing these unapproved alleged locutions of revelations is immunity from errors in the facts. How many out there predict things that never come true, and yet people still follow them? It is really sad that people do not learn Criteria number three, sound personal qualities of the subject. The alleged seer ought to possess particular mental balance, honesty, rectitude of moral life, habitual sincerity, lead a life enriched by the teachings of the church and the sacraments. Criteria number four, Mental balance. Common sense cautions when to be slow to believe someone who seems to have mental or emotional disorders, psychic disorders, psychopathic tendencies. Criteria number six, a healthy devotion and spiritual fruits which endure. And these include prayer, charity, works of mercy, conversions associated with the messages and so forth. Criteria number seven, or is this number six? Yeah, I think this is number six. <laughs> obedience toward ecclesiastical authority. Now, remember, obedience is not a heteronomy. It is not a blind internal impulse, as some maintain. And this is emphasized in Gaudium et Spes, numbers 17 and 79. Even in the encyclical, Veritati Splendor, numbers 41 through 42. The Church does not advocate blind obedience, but an internal, informed obedience. Obedience here signifies that the seer acknowledges that Christ himself puts pastors in charge of his flock who are to lead them. This is buttressed in Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28. And obeying legitimate authorities in matter to which the authority extends. So, if a pastor goes beyond his limits, there is no reason to obey him. Criteria number, where are we now? Seven. Not seeking monetary gain or fame. How often do we see people, even on television, donning <laughs> expensive jewelry, right? I mean, I'm not saying that that's in and of itself wrong, but one cannot claim to be commissioned by God for the pursuit of money, fame, or self-aggrandizement. Evident seeking of financial advantage, closely associated with the message, is a sign of deception. 
Criteria number eight, growth in Christian virtue, which I touched upon. The seer who claims to receive a message or has a special mission from God and is endowed with special graces to accompany that mission must grow in virtue. Every tree is known by its fruit. And if God is the tree producing the fruit, well, the fruit must be growth in virtue and the other criteria, cri criteria I mentioned such as graces which endure. And last but not least, criteria number nine. And that is fulfilled prophecies. And this is self-explanatory. Now, God has given us many modern messages through Mary, through prophets like Faustina, like Luisa Picaretta, Right? Like Father Gobi, that also has the approval of the Church, the Imprimatur, and others. And yet, the people that run after the latest and greatest so called alleged rev revelation or locution stop reading these. You notice that? And yet, these messages approved by the Church are for these end times. It is a far greater and more safe path to follow that which the Church has given its approval to, and that has been given in modern times, than to overlook these, expecting something new every day. People have asked me to endorse certain works, to join certain blogs and websites, and I've refused, because these promote exactly what I am cautioning you to, running after unapproved revelations asserted by people that have no episcopal or ecclesial support. This is a dangerous path. And as I mentioned, by virtue of the fact that the majority are not true, it makes it even more dangerous. Now, I'm not condemning the initiative to welcome fresh messages from God and Mary. But what I am doing is saying, on the one hand, be open, but on the other, be cautious, because the vast majority of them are not authentic. Being cautious in this field of spiritual theology is healthy. Now, Luisa Picaretta exemplified this very disposition I'm communicating to you. Do you see her running after all the various contemporary revelations in her day? And there were many. Even Father Hannibal, St. Hannibal, not only directed Louisa, he directed Melanie Calvat of La Salette. He directed Maria, the foundress of the Sisters of Divine Zeal, who is now a saint. And he was guiding seven, around seven or eight mystics, in, in, including Louisa. Louisa was not reading any of their messages. <laughs> all right. And Hannibal was approached by several people to review this and review that. And, he's and he told the people of his day exactly what I'm telling you. Don't go running around the latest. And Jesus says the same thing in Scripture, does he not? In the end times, he said, there will be people saying, here is the Christ, there is the Christ. Do not follow them. These are the words of Christ, the words of Hannibal, and all I'm doing is simply reiterating them to you for your own spiritual welfare. Now, back to Louisa. The hours of the Passion, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the Kingdom of the Divine will both receive official ecclesiastical approval. The imprimatur of the Nihil Upstadt. So anyone who tells you that Louisa's writings are false, do not follow them. They are false guides because they're going against the magisterial seals of the Church. Admittedly, the Church is in the process of preparing her critical edition and fully assimilating the profound doctrines of her theology. And it's not, not an easy task, because, as I mentioned in the past, if you approach the writings of Louisa purely using the lenses of scholasticism, you will not have come to understand that they are from God. 
if you use exclusively the lenses of patristicism, analyzing the real writings of Louisa, you will not believe that they come from God. If, however, you use both lenses for both eyes, just like the two lungs beat in one body, as Pope John Paul II said when referring to both the Eastern and Western churches, that is, the Orthodox and Catholic, if you use both the patristic lens from the East and the scholastic lens from the West, when reading Louisa's writings, then you will come to the understanding that these are certainly from God. They are so profound in their theology that both the first thousand years of Eastern patristic theology and the latter thousand years of Western scholastic theology must be used when reading them in order to determine whether or not they are authentic and from God. Because she speaks of things that the West, Western scholasticism does not. And of things that the Eastern patristic theology does not. So in my doctoral dissertation approved by the Pontifical University of Rome on Louisa's writings, I present both, both theologies. This has never been done before. And I compare point by point all of her doctrines with both schools of theology. And only for this reason was my dissertation approved by the Pontifical University of Rome, authorized by the Holy See, which is the Vatican. Now, Louisa preaches a theology of light. I presented this to you in the last two to three weeks. And I mentioned at the outset of this talk that we are living in days of darkness, days of confusion. And we need guidance. We're giving a lot of false narratives from the fake news media. We know that. And this fake news media was foreseen by a mystic from Turin, Italy, back in 18, the 1800s, whose body is incorrupt, whom I had visited when I was living in Italy for 20 years. His name is Saint Don Bosco. Now, Don was not his name. <laughs> <laughs> Don means in it's a it's a it's a diminutive, a nickname for Lord. So for example, when you see a priest you say father or reverend, right? Well, back in the day they would call a priest Don, which is short for Lord, in Latin, which is Domino. You make Domino short, it becomes Don, like Don Scotus, right? Don Bosco, Don Quixote, <laughs> well, that's another animal. Well, you have Don, right? That means Lord. It's a sign of respect like Sir. So Don Bosco would receive mystical visions while he was asleep, oftentimes, like St. Joseph. And in one of his visions of 1862, which is very apropos to us today with the fake news media, we find that in the end times, the church is at war with the fake news media. Don Bosco had this vision, and he said it was for the end times. And what was this vision about? It was about this battle between the church and all those enemies thereof. Let me read an excerpt from this vision of 1862. He writes, The supreme commander of a big ship that I beheld, a big vessel, was the supreme Roman pontiff. The Roman pontiff, seeing the fury of the enemies and the evils among which his faithful find themselves, determines to summon around him captains of smaller ships to hold a council and decide what is to be done much like this Pope, right, convenes councils and his predecessors convene councils. Or I should say synods, those kind of small councils. All the captains come aboard and gather around the Pope. 
they hold a meeting. But meantime, the wind and the waves gather in storm. The Pope stands at the helm, and all his energies are directed to steering the ship toward those two columns, above which are the Eucharist and the Blessed Mother. All the enemy ships move to attack, and they try in every way to stop it and sink it. Some enemy boats use as ammunition books, writings, and inflammable materials. Now, this is what I wish to emphasize. Here we are speaking of a vision in 1862 meant for today. Now, back then there was no internet, no television, no fake news media, but there was fake news, but it was a media of books, periodicals, newsletters. There was no cinema. So... The fake news media in the days of Don Bosco are today the television, the internet, cinematography, and newsletters, and magazines, of which they are full. He continues, the battle rages ever more relentlessly. Suddenly the Pope falls, gravely wounded, and the new Pope, putting the enemy to rout and overcoming every obstacle, guides the ship right up to the two columns of Jesus and Mary and comes to rest between them. He makes it, he makes it fast with a light chain that hangs from the bow to an anchor of the column on which stands the host uh, and with another light chain which hangs from the stern. Now see, Don Bosco uses this imagery of light chains that attach the vessel which represents the church to Jesus in the Eucharist and Mary, help of Christians. Now, why does he mention these light chains? Sound familiar with Louisa's writings? I'm going to refer you to a passage where she speaks of these chains of light. Consider the message of volume 20, September 23rd, 1926. Here Jesus tells her, Louisa, nothing must escape you who must provide a universal blessing if all souls are to bind, I'm sorry, if you are to bind all souls to the blessing you wish to give them. Okay, so just as the church was anchored to the Eucharist and Mary by chains of light, so Jesus is telling Louisa nothing must escape her if she is to provide a universal blessing to bind, to bind all souls to the blessing she wishes to give them. He tells her, to make up for all, I empower the acts done in my will to form double chains of light that form the strongest and longest bonds that nothing can break. Indeed, no one has the ability to break a chain of light, as it is more powerful than a sun ray that no one can extinguish. And no one can stop a ray of this chain of light from arriving at whatever place, length, and width it intends to reach. These chains of light compel God to give universal blessings and compel the soul to receive them. All right, he also speaks of double chains of light in volume 20, September 23rd, 1926. Okay, now the point is, this light, that of which Don Bosco speaks when addressing the fake news media, these double chains of light of which Jesus speaks to Louisa when encouraging her not to neglect anything, emerge from the uncreated light of God. Now, I'm going to share with you several passages, as I did last week, but new passages, on how this light fills the void in our soul that God has placed there, and how God deposits through this uncreated light, which is generated by his creative power, 
deposits all these acts in our souls. So it's really God who operates in us, who is depositing everything we do in our will. We are cooperating with that act of depositing, but it is ultimately God who deposits through light and his creative power all the good acts we do that are deposited within our will. Now, before I share these new passages with you, let me continue the theme I began about the darkness we're living in in these end times that Don Bosco addressed when addressing the weapons of war that see, that the enemy is used to seek to bring down the church, namely periodicals, the, the social media, the fake news media. You know, there's one thing the fake news media is good at, and that is spreading fear. It's a media creation. Now, if you think about it, when the COVID pandemic broke out, there was a lot of fear generated by the news, only to find out a year later that the survival rate without any vaccine without any medical intervention, I should say, pharmaceutical medical intervention, is no, over 99% of the average person. But initially, you know, there was a big scare. And people didn't want to get close to each other, didn't want to even smile at each other. They covered their faces. And they use a funny number, not seven feet distance, but six feet distance. How, how unusual is that? Anyway, we're finding the same narrative from the media of this scare approach with this impending war in Ukraine. I'm not saying there's no need to be concerned. Don't confuse what I'm saying here. Certainly, we need to give attention to these things. What I'm saying is that fear is useless. And Jesus said the same thing. And this is what the media is promoting. We are living in the times of Lent, when we should reduce our exposure to the media. That's promoting fear. This is a time for us to be close to the intimate with the love of God, which is only established with trust, not with fear. This is a time when we should get close to God. Now, Jesus tells Louisa that trust is what expedites the soul's progress in the divine will, and fear cripples and saps it of its hope, faith, and love. Just food for thought, because when we talk about the writings of Louisa and the uncreated light of God that establishes within us chains of light that connect us to all creation, through the divine acts that God performs in us with which we cooperate, it is founded upon a trusting, loving, confident, secure relationship with God. Not the approach that the media is iterating, which is save your own skin. No, it's not, that's not the approach. Jesus said, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever seeks to lose his life for my sake will save it for all eternity. This is the narrative of Christ and the narrative of Louisa. It's contrary to the narrative of the media. Jesus never tells Louisa, store up for yourselves load truckloads of food, because what's going to come is going to be so bad that you really have to look out for yourself. No, that's not what Jesus tells Louisa. And whenever you hear a pro alleged prophet saying this, do not follow them. There will be no refuge in food. There will be no refuge in anything except the sacred and immaculate hearts. They will provide for you. They will inspire you to go where and when should the time come. What does Jesus say, right, <laughs> about that rich man who stored up all this storage of granary in his barn. And he said, I have so much that I can now relax and enjoy life. And Jesus said, you fool, I will call you this evening. Well, what did Jesus say in Matthew's gospel? I think it's chapter six. He says, do not worry about what you are to eat, what you are to drink, 
The pagans think of these things. This is not you. You are Christians. Do not worry about these things. Consider the lilies of the field who neither sow nor weep, nor, nor work, nor toil, right? And yet God provides for them. You have little faith. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's worries are sufficient for themselves. Think of only the present. And God will provide the rest. You do your best and God does the rest. Well, today we are in these end times. And we are experiencing exactly what Don Bosco prophesied about the fake news media attacking the church and attacking the members of the church through fear. It's a virus. This fear is a greater virus than COVID. Well, that which will save us is not food and it's not a vaccine. It is the sacred and the immaculate hearts. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 11, May 18th, 1915, the divine justice imposes chastisements, but neither these nor God's enemies get close to those souls who live in the divine will. Know that I have regard for the souls who live in my will and for the places where these souls reside. I, the King of Heaven, have my courts and quarters on earth. These are the souls who live in my will and in whom I live. The heavenly court, the heavenly court crowds around them. The strength of my will keeps them safe, rendering their enemies' bullets ineffective, driving back the fiercest enemies. I place the souls who live in my will on earth in the same condition as the blessed in heaven. Therefore, live in my will and fear nothing. Unquote. Jesus' words to Louisa. So the souls who live completely in God's divine will have nothing to fear, you see. God will provide for them. If they focus 100% on God's divine will, God will focus 100% on them. If they focus 50% on God's divine will and the other for 50% on food, clothing, and shelter, and surviving, well, then God will focus 50% on them. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 6, May 18th, 1905, My daughter, fear deprives love of life. Let me repeat that. May 18th, 1905. Fear deprives love of life. Not only this, but fear also deprives the virtues themselves, which do not originate in love. Fear decreases the love of the life of love in the soul, for in all things love should be given preference over fear, as love makes everything easy, or as the very virtues which do not originate in love but in fear become like victims and end up lifeless. He tells her in volume 13, November 8, 1921, My daughter, do not fear. Same thing Jesus said to the apostles who were afraid when the winds and the storm grew. And he came walking across the waters, and they said, it is a ghost. He said, fear not, it is I. Nulite temere ego sum, in Latin, in the Vulgate. He tells Louisa in volume 19, July 18th, 1926, my daughter, do not fear. And he tells her, well, he tells her on and on and on. I'll, I'll limit myself to these few messages, and I'll use two biblical passages to support Louisa's teaching, or Jesus' teaching to us through Louisa. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. You, do not you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, why does Paul associate fear in the same sentence with Abba? Here, Paul is speaking to the, to the Romans, and he uses a Greek word, Abba, right? Because that means Dada. That's the child's name for the father. 
You see the kind of trust that Paul is using to counter fear? He said you did not receive a spirit of slavery again to fear, but you received the spirit. He doesn't say the father or the son. And this is the same third fiat that casts out fear through trust in God's will, whereby we also cry out, Dada, Abba, Father. First letter of John, chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. And this is what the media will never give you. It won't give you love, it will give you fear. Now, God's creative power engenders light in the soul, engendering security, confidence, trust, tranquility, confidence, empowering it to form its own light that casts its rays throughout creation to the greater glory of all. Now, I'm going to share with you a few passages, and before I do, I wish to take a little break and ask you to continue to support Radio Maria. It is 100% listener-supported and commercial-free. We are right now in the Mariathon, asking you to, in the season of Lent, to intensify your works and prayers, which is what we all do. We give to the poor, we help the orphans, the widows, we help those venues that promote the faith. We do penance, we do prayers, we do fasting. So be generous, because as I mentioned last time, this is the only program I'm aware of in the world that is either, either through radio waves or television waves inclusive that promotes the writings of the servant of God, Louisa in this way. So be generous and know that when you give, you receive back. This is a program that continues to give sound Christian teachings on sacred scripture, magisterial doctrines, by way of councils, encyclicals, motu proprios, bulls, etc., and by way of Louisa Picaretta's writings teaching you the gift of living in the divine will. Volume 36 of Louisa's writings, April 12, 1938, Jesus tells us, We hear the I love you of one who lives in our will in the little bird that trills and warbles and sings. We hear the I love you in the ardor of the soul's love who wants to love more. The soul can enter our creative act and delight itself with new suns, new heavens, new stars, making us say unceasingly, I love you. I love you. And taking part in narrating our glory. Volume 12, December 22nd, 1920. Jesus tells Louisa, my daughter, the simplest expression, will of God, contains the creative power. Whence it has the power of creating, transforming, and consuming, so as to make new torrents of light, love, and sanctity flow into the soul. So, so you see, God's creative power generates this uncreated light that comes from the uncreated Godhead. that penetrates the soul. Volume 11, September 21, 1913. Containing the creative power within myself, I speak and I create, just as one day I spoke and created the sun. The cooperation of my will with the soul enables it to participate in my own creative power. So you see, God does not only engender this light and infuse it within our soul, but he draws the soul into that light whereby it participates in the light and therefore in his own creative power, which is the source of the light. April 25th, 1937. My little daughter of the supreme fiat, 
Our love is so much that as soon as the creature calls our will into her act, our will runs and descends into the act. And while the soul pronounce and while I'm sorry, while my will pronounces its fiat, in the little place of the creature, it forms such miracles and marvels <clears throat> that the sky, the sun, and all else remain behind. And it surpasses all the beauty of creation. My will creates there its divine music, the most refulgent suns. Volume 36, May 6, 1938. As we, the Trinity, find the creator, the creature in our will, we can do whatever we want. The soul will be ready to receive our creative power. So by entering the divine will, God communicates to us his divine power and therefore his divine light, which enables him to do whatever he wants in our soul, so long as we remain there. And you know what keeps us in the divine will? People have asked me this in the past. How do I remain in the divine will? Perseverance. It sounds simple, but it's profound. I know there's a passage in Louise's writings where he tells her this. And um, I'm going to see if I can pull it up here. If I can find it, rather. I think it's in volume... Hmm. I think it's in volume four and five. Yes, it's in volume four, January 31st, 1901, and in volume five, June 2nd, 1905. He also tells Louisa in volume seven, January 30th, 1906, that he gives her a chain of graces that enables her to persevere and remain in his will through perseverance. He tells her everything. Everything is linked to the way of the soul's working with perseverance. My chain of graces is linked to persevering works. So if the soul makes some escapes from my will, it breaks this chain. And who can ensure that it will be repaired? My designs are accomplished only in the soul who seals its works with perseverance. With perfection, sanctity, everything. Everything is linked to perseverance. But if the soul is inconstant, it works without perseverance, and like an intermittent fever, it renders God's divine designs useless eviscerates his work of perfection and fails to attain sanctity. So perseverance is important. Remember Jesus telling Louisa on one occasion when speaking of acts, how he does not count time but acts, that oftentimes a person prays and prays and prays and perseveres in that prayer and then all of a sudden after many years of praying they receive what they want. And then he asks her, do you suppose it was because of that last prayer that the soul obtained what it asked for? He said, no. It was account, on account of the soul's persevering prayer over the course of a long time that it obtained what it asked for. Or remember the passage in the scripture where Jesus said that there was this woman who wanted to settle an argument and kept banging on the door of this unjust judge and the unjust judge did not want to get out of bed at midnight. But because she kept banging on the door, he said, because of her perseverance, I will give to her what she asks, just to get rid of her. <laughs> so perseverance is what keeps us in the divine will and keeps us from escaping thereof. 
Jesus also, I mentioned volume 4, May 30th, 1901, right? Jesus tells her in this volume, it is, perse it is perseverance in the good alone that reveals whether or not a soul is truly virtuous. This alone is what unites all the virtues together. It can be said that perseverance alone perpetually unites God to the soul. There it is, volume 4, May 30th, 1901. I'll repeat it again. It can be said that perseverance alone perpetually unites God to the soul as well as grace to the virtues. Whence the persevering soul, in placing all of those around itself like a chain, binds everything together and forms the most secure knot of salvation. Conversely, where there is no perseverance, there is much to fear. Now, I spoke of the creative power of God, how these chains of light alluded to in Don Bosco's vision of these end times, where the church is at war with the media and fear generated thereof, um, is being infused in the soul, this light, this creative power of God, these chains of light are being infused in the soul, who lives in his will, whereby it perseveres and remains constant despite the war around it, despite the darkness around it. Now, I will share with you the beginning of what I will continue in my next segment, which is the Eastern theology of light. I spoke to you about the West, Western theology of light. Now, in the East, there are, there's Gregory Palamas, Saint Gregory Palamas, who spoke of light perhaps better than any other Eastern father. There's another father I'll mention next week from the East that speaks of light as well. But St. Gregory, Palamas, enduring the Byzantine Empire in the 14th century, he, um, was part of what's called the Hesychast spirituality or Hesychast controversy. And there was a dispute. That's why it's called the controversy. A dispute that was centered upon the claims of the hesychastic monks, that is, that they could see the uncreated divine light of God. The two parties in the dispute that had very different views about the nature of divine knowledge and light, as far as Barlam of Calabria was concerned, had to do with man's knowledge of God based solely on analogical reasoning and abstraction from the things present in the world a priori experience, which, as he saw it, revealed to the human mind their creator. Human mind's their creator. Whereas on the other side of this controversy was St. Gregory Palamas, who held that the natural or the secular knowledge, as we call it, was capable of, incapable of transcending the created world in order to bring about a real knowledge of God. Okay? St. Gregory... Um, saw natural knowledge and supernatural knowledge in two different lights. And this is where he contrasted with Barlam of Calabria. So I'll go more into the controversy in next week's talk, but for now, let me limit myself to saying that the Father, according to St. Gregory Palamas, is the cause of this uncreated light. The Son begets this light, and the Holy Spirit processes this light. Sort of like from the Father, the Son is begotten, and from both the Father and the Son processes the Holy Spirit. And this uncreated light that comes from these three divine persons is reflected in what St. Gregory Palamas refers to as divine energies, energia in Greek divine energies, because the divine energies are what he calls personalized gifts of God's presence to the soul. And they flow out in the same divine order from the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally reach the soul. 
they flow out in the same divine order of the three divine persons as they arrive in the soul. And it should be noted that man returns, goes back into this divine procession. So the Father descends threefold, and the soul's intellect, memory, and will return this glory to the Father with a light threefold. So the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, through the works of creation, redemption, and sanctification, produce light in the soul. And the soul's will requites the creative power of the Father. The soul's intellect requites the Son's knowledge. And the Holy Spirit's memory requites the all-knowingness of God. To put it another way, the order of God's manifestation or self-revelation involves the condense condescension of God as he moves down to meet man, <clears throat> while man is drawn up to God in the process of what's called in the East divinization, or theosis, which is the same as divinization. Deification. Man becomes like God, but not God himself. On the inside of man, there is God. But on the outside, there's the thin veil of man's humanity, his nature. But on the inside, it's all God. Possessing, imbuing, penetrating, guiding, controlling, accompanying all of man's thoughts, words, and actions. Thereby um, establishing a triune indwelling. Well, that's it for now, my brothers and sisters in Christ. May God bless you in this first week of Lent and keep you in his most holy will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.